work with Mark Jacob. It's joint work with Mark Jacob and Gabriele Graton. Um, just as a reminder, this is um, 50 minutes plus um, 10 minutes for questions at the end. But, you know, we'll see how things go. Um, if you have questions, just unmute yourselves and ask. Um, we only have um, Barton here. The co-authors are not going to be here. So um, I don't think we can ask them to mend the chat. So um, if you do ask a question in the chat, we'll, we'll ask for you. But it's easier if you just unmute yourselves. Um, and yeah, just a reminder, that next week we're going to have Andrew Little, uh, and he's going to talk about communication and coordination in the shadow of repression. So without any further ado, Barton, please take it away. All right, thank you for the introduction. It's of course a great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk to you about a new working paper. It's called From Gridlock to Polarization. It's joined with Mark Yarkov, who was at ETH Zurich, and now he's at Stanford, and Gabriele Graton at UNSW Sydney. So the starting point is an observation I think everyone would be familiar with, which is that the US Congress in the modern era is experiencing high and increasing levels of political polarization at the elite level. And so this is a figure from Barbara McCarty. It's looking at uh, the polarization between the two parties in both the House and the Senate. It's just the standard DW nominate measure of ideology. So coming from roll call based measures. And what you can see is since the 1970s there has been this dramatic rise in political polarization. And so there's many reasons to be concerned about polarization, but one of the core policy consequences is what's known as legislative gridlock. So Congress's inability or decreasing ability to pass legislation that enact uh, laws that address important issues for voters. And so the figure on the right takes a very you know, mechanical look at this and shows that the enacted laws over time has been decreasing in the Congress. But you could also think about the number of proposed policies that actually become law, and that's also low and decreasing. The figure on the right is from Sarah Binder, and it looks at the percent of salient issues that are in legislative gridlock. So she looks at policy issues that are discussed in mainstream media, and at the end of each congress congressional term asks whether any law was passed to address that issue. And as you can see, around 1947, around 30% of issues are left unaddressed, but then it increases to about 70% in the modern era. Okay. And so the basic intuition about why polarization should cause legislative gridlock is simple. It's that as parties polarize, they become more ideologically distant. It's going to be hard for them to find bipartisan policies and find common agreement. And so most policies that come up are going to lie in this so-called gridlock interval and less policies are going to pass. And beyond just being a theory, there's robust empirical evidence that periods of higher political polarization do indeed correspond to higher periods of legislative gridlock. But if we take a step back and think about how polarization has come about in the US, some puzzles emerge in the sense that we know that legislators at an aggregate level have continued to polarize since the 1970s. Over the same time period, a large body of work tells us that actually most voters over this same period maintain rather moderate policy preferences. Okay, and this is summarized in this quote by Barbara McCarty, who say, the emerging consensus is that most voters have been and remain overwhelmingly moderate in their policy positions. The second observation is that despite these moderate positions, the polarization that we see largely stems from elections. Each time the voters go to the booths, they choose to elect more and more extreme legislators. And this is summarized in this recent work by Moskowitz, Rogowski, and Snyder that says, the replacement of relatively moderate legislators with more ideologically extreme legislators explains virtually all the recent growth in partisan polarization. And so if we put both of these observations together, it suggests an important puzzle and an important question, which is that if most voters are moderate in their policy preferences, why are they choosing to elect extremes? Right? And this is a question that we're interested in. And so what do we do? We, we propose that legislative gridlock itself might actually be a cause uh, of polarization. It might lead moderate voters to support extreme candidates at higher rates. And what's important about this argument is it reverses the typical direction of causality, whereas most of the existing theories would say polarization causes gridlock. We're not denying that, but we're thinking that there's a second uh, effect that that goes in the reverse direction and has perhaps been overlooked. And the basic theory is extremely simple. and that moderate but partisan voters are going to vote for co-partisan candidates who hold extreme positions, positions that even these moderate voters don't like, if they expect gridlock on these issues. They expect gridlock is going to make policy change less likely. And so ultimately, the status quo policy is more likely to prevail. And so voters can safely discount extremism. OK, and instead, they're going to focus on other features of the candidate that are going to be more policy relevant. So things like party affiliation, the more moderate goals of the party, 
or maybe the more moderate goals of that same candidate on other issues that are less gridlocked. Okay. And this also suggests a, an interaction between these two phenomena where gridlock can cause elite polarization, but then by these uh, kind of older theories, polarization causes gridlock and the two phenomena feed onto each other, okay, leading to this kind of vicious spiral. So that's the theory. But what we think is the real contribution of this paper is to actually ask whether these effects hold in reality and whether we can actually observe this mechanism in the wild. And so to do that, we, we run a survey experiment. It's a large scale online experiment with around 8,700 voting age Americans. The basic structure is that we elicit subjects' partisan leanings. So we know who's a Republican, who's a Democrat, and their policy preferences. Then we randomly assign subjects information about gridlock. So this is a treatment. And so it's information about gridlock on a specific policy issue. And then after that, we measure their beliefs about the likelihood of policy change. So this gives us a sense of their perception of gridlock. And then the main outcomes from these so-called candidate choice tasks, which are hypothetical elections between a Republican and a Democrat. And uh, voters are going to, the subjects are going to choose who to vote for in these hypothetical elections and where the candidates hold different policy positions on different issues. Okay, we're interested in their willingness to vote for a co-parson who holds either moderate or extreme policy positions. Okay, and how it's affected by the uh, treatment assignment. Barton, can I interrupt for a second? And, sure. and because you ran through the theory uh, qu quite fast, and I'm not sure if I understood. So the link why gridlock causes more polarization. So why I can imagine the, the going on the opposite way. So there's a gridlock. So I vote for for more likely larger party in the middle, and therefore less polarization. Would that depend on voting rules or or some you know electoral system? What's the so I, I'm going to go through the theory again. So maybe oh, okay. maybe I'll wait till then if that's okay. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, so let me just preview the findings, and then as I mentioned, we'll get into the theory. So the, ex the experimental evidence that we have supports our main prediction. So first, we show that our gridlock treatment works as intended. It makes subjects have lower beliefs about the possibility of policy change. Okay, so they become more pessimistic. And furthermore, this gridlock treatment makes sub moderate subjects more likely to vote for a co-parson who holds extreme positions, okay? But furthermore, we show evidence in support of our broader theory of, of discounting extremism. So we have a number of secondary predictions. And furthermore, we think about alternative mechanisms that could at least explain this first prediction, this main prediction. And we show that the evidence that we have more generally is hard to reconcile with these alternative theories, okay? And again, I'll be specific about all of these as we go along, okay? So let me give you a, a brief roadmap. So I'll present the theoretical framework and show you how we derive our predictions. And so that should clarify some of these questions. Uh, then once we have that language, I'm gonna connect it to the literature, just mention what we're doing new and what's not new, and then jump into the experimental design, results, broad implications and conclusions. Okay. So I'm gonna present the theoretical framework. What I wanna emphasize first is that this is not a model. It, it's a very simple stylized example of what a voter might face and the type of decision problem that they might have to consider. Okay, and then we're going to map this into our experiment. Okay, so the, the simple setting is that the voter has to choose between two candidates. One's going to be a co parson and one's going to be an opposition candidate or an out party candidate. The candidate's going to have platforms. They're going to address two different policy issues. The first issue is going to be rather mechanical. It's just going to be the core party issues. So each party holds their party line. So the co party, if you're a Democrat, holds the Democratic party line. The Republican, the out party will hold the Republican party line on these other issues. The second issue is where most of the action is going to be at, where the opponent holds the status quo position and the co-parson holds either a moderate or extreme position in the co-parson direction. So the liberal direction if they're a Democrat, the conservative direction if they're a Republican. The key idea about how we put gridlock into this story is that the enacted policies, of course, might differ from policy platforms. And so again, issue one is going to be rather mechanical. The enacted policy on this first issue is simply going to be the elected candidate's party line. Okay. But on the second issue, it might be gridlocked. Okay. If this issue is gridlocked, then the enacted policy is going to be the elected candidate's position with some probability less than one. So one, one, one minus G. And otherwise, with probability G, it's going to be the status quo. Okay. So gridlock is going to make it harder to change the status quo. In contrast, if there's no gridlock, then the enacted policy is simply the elected candidate's position with probability one, okay? So you can think about gridlock as uh, this parameter G as being the intensity of gridlock, 
if G is close to one, then almost anything that an elected candidate stands for is unlikely to go through. The status quo is going to prevail. If it's close to zero, then, then of course, they're going to have a lot of power to move the policy. Okay. So in terms of the voters' preferences, they care about enacted policies, not platforms. Okay, and they care about these across both issues. But of course, the voters' partisan, I've been talking about co-partisan candidates and, and opposition candidates. And so on issue one, they're of course going to prefer their co-partisan candidate. Okay, so their utility on this first dimension, U subscript one, uh, from their co-partisan position on issue one is strictly greater than their heart partisan. So the decision problem that the voter ultimately faces is that they want to choose a candidate to maximize their expected utility. And they care about both of these issues, but they might care about them to differing extents. Okay, so this parameter sigma captures the weight. And so this is the relative salience of issue two. So if sigma is close to one, then they're primarily, primarily going to vote based on this second issue. If it's close to zero, they're going to vote primarily based on the first issue. Okay, and, and you can have anything in between. Okay. So the main focus of, of the paper and the motivation is when you have a moderate voter who faces an extreme co -partisan. Okay, so I want to paint this example uh, for you. So you can imagine a spatial domain here. You have the status quo policy somewhere. To the left of it, you have the moderate policy. And then in the same direction, you have an extreme policy. So you can think about the federal minimum wage. It's currently 725 in the US, that's the status quo. A liberal position, a moderate position could be a $10 minimum wage. And an extreme position could be a $35 minimum wage, okay? And we're going to think about a moderate voter as someone who prefers policy changes in their preferred direction, so long as they're not too extreme, okay? So I want a $10 minimum wage over maintaining the status quo, but I've had to choose between a $35 minimum wage, so a change in the same direction that's very large, or maintaining the status quo, I'd actually rather maintain the status quo. I think 35 is too large, it would tank the economy, okay? So a moderate voter is someone who prefers the moderate policy, then the status quo, then the extreme policy. Okay, that's the setting that we're thinking about. And then this candidate, this, this voter has to choose between two candidates. One's a co-partisan who, who holds an extreme position on this second issue. So their platform is PCE. Or an opponent who holds the out party position on the first issue. But on the second issue, they want to maintain the status quo. Okay. And so the obvious tension here is that on the first issue, the moderate voter prefers their co-partisan. Okay, they align with the party line and this vote is a partisan. But on the second issue, the moderate voter actually prefers the opposition's party. Their extreme co-partisan is too extreme. This $35 minimum wage is too large, right? And so who the voter ultimately votes for depends on two things. It depends on the salience of this second issue. So how much I actually care about this second issue where I have this tension but also whether issue two is gridlocked, because if it's gridlocked, then this extreme policy is less likely to go through, the status quo is more likely to prevail, and that's in line with what the opponent was doing anyway, okay? And of course, it will also depend on the intensity of gridlock. Okay, so let me spell out those details a little bit more. So what is the effect of gridlock? If we suppose the second issue is not gridlocked, okay? If I elect my co-partisan, then the extreme policy is gonna be enacted with probability one. If I elect the opponent, then the status quo policy is going to be maintained with probability one. Okay, I'm a moderate voter. I don't like the extreme policy. And so I'm only going to vote for my co-partisan if my salience or the amount that I care about this second issue is sufficiently low. Okay, and so there's some region or interval where I'm going to vote for it. But if the second issue is gridlocked, then the point B is still true. So if I elect my opponent, the status quo prevails with probability one. But now if I elect my co-partisan, the extreme policy is enacted with some probability less than one one minus G, okay? With probability G, the status quo prevails. So now this extreme policy that I was concerned about is less likely to go through. And because of gridlock, I can rationally discount extremism. I know it's unlikely to go through. And so what that means is that for now, for a larger range of salience intervals, I'm more likely to vote for my extreme co -partisan. okay? So that makes me more likely to vote for them because I'm less concerned about this negative feature. Okay. And so of course, in reality, voters are going to have different levels of salience of these various issues. They also likely have different beliefs about the intensity of gridlock. But what we can say is that for distributions with full support, gridlock is going to increase a moderate voter's propensity to vote for an extreme co -partisan. Okay. And so that's the main hypothesis that we test, and that's just to fix ideas, and that's what we're going to uh, map into the experiment. Okay. But some of you might have noticed, perhaps, which is, of course, that our framework is not specific to moderate voters. 
or extreme co-partisan. So you could think about, well, what if the voter actually wants extreme policies? So the most preferred policy is extreme, then the moderate, then the status quo, or maybe I prefer status quo policies the most and dislike any policy change. You can rerun this, this exercise and, and draw out the predictions. And we do this in the paper. And we also test these secondary predictions too. And, and, our, and our experimental data is, is broadly aligned with these secondary predictions as well. Okay. Okay. So that's the theoretical model. Um, I'm happy to take questions if there's anything. Yeah. Uh, I yes, just yes. want to confirm if I, uh, so this is for the, works well for the two candidate or two party system. Mm -hmm. So one way to test it would be to see if there's the similar mechanism occurring in, in, in different systems, which probably would be weaker. Am I thinking? Right way. Yeah, so I have a little bit to say about that on the next slide, um, but you know, obviously, this is focusing on on US politics. Yeah. Um, Barto, can I ask? But I mean, is this mechanism, this main hypothesis, going to be true? Um, if in in those other cases that you didn't really show us, I mean, um, so this seems to require the 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 a situation where. The choice is between an extremist on my side and somebody who's somewhat moderate on 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 the other side, and so this argument goes through. But but if you had a moderate on my side and so on, things. So in other words, are you going to tell us that given a random draw of extremists and moderates and so on from from sides and so on, everything else being equal, gridlock is going to increase gridlock or or is it do you need particular things to happen because one thing you're not doing is explaining to us why you face a partisan or a non-partisan on either side right you're you're mm -hmm. just assuming that that comes exogenously at some point yeah 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 um, so, so you're not explaining the time series really because mm -hmm. um you know that's what i thought you were going to do at some point that you know you have these cycles of more or less gridlock Mm -hmm. so what you have here is a story. Well, if if we have gridlock and partisanship on on one side, then these things work out. So um, I don't know. Maybe we should discuss this at the end. <laughs> so I will have some things to say about that too in in, in two more slides. Okay. 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 So uh, firstly, on the on the related literature, the the key theoretical mechanism is that voters might discount extreme policy promises, right? They acknowledge that there's a legislative process and not everything that gets promised goes through. This is far from novel, it's not new. If you go back to Anthony Downs, he talks about exactly this. He says, you know, a rational voter should know that no candidate ever fully succeeds in their platform. And so they should discount their promises and potentially vote for someone who's further away from them in their platform. Uh, and, and it's of course being built on by other people. So Bernie Groffman has work on it, Alessina and Rosenthal use some of these ideas. It, of course, appears a lot in parliamentary voting systems or coalition government problems where you vote for a party, you know that they're not going to form government by themselves, they're going to form government as part of a coalition, and so that's going to water down their policy position, okay? And so this idea, of course, exists there. What we think is new is connecting this systematic rise in legislative gridlock, something which is clearly observable and measurable, to this mechanism of discounting extremism and in turn to political polarization. Okay, because it's a bit hard to think about, you know, what would lead to a systematic rise in, in difficulty in forming coalition governments in, in these parliamentary systems, right? Whereas here we have something which is observable, which we can actually track and, and think about. So but beyond this, you know, despite being a very simple mechanism, it of course derives this novel prediction that gridlock causes elite polarization. So as I mentioned earlier, most of the theoretical and empirical literature says the reverse, polarization causes gridlock. We don't deny that. Uh, but, but we think that there's a second channel that's important. There's some exceptions that show that gridlock can cause polarization, such as a work by Viola Zuda and Antoine Loper and Alessina and Rosenthal. But these works are much more party based. So, you know, we're two parties bargaining. I realize that in the future, there's going to be more gridlock. And so if I want to get policies through, I should really be careful about what we agree to today. And so I'm going to strategically polarize today because policy change is going to be harder in the future. Okay, that's, that's very much a party-based story. Our story puts the voter at the center of the story, and it matches some of these empirical observations that, that I'm motivated to talk with. Okay, so to come to uh, Francesco's questions, so let me first talk about primary elections and then, and then some supply-side constraints. 
So the first thing I want to say is that general election races have become increasingly uncompetitive in the US. And primary elections are really where all the action is at. This is what determines who gets elected and the amount of polarization we see. Okay. Whereas our framework is very much general election focused. You have a Republican running against a Democrat, and we're trying to understand who votes for who and why. Okay. But our general election focus might also explain this trend, right? So if we've seen increasing levels of legislative gridlock, our theory says that it should lead you know, moderate co-partisans to be less likely to swing. They're more likely to vote for the extreme co-partisan. And so this could explain the declining competitiveness of general elections, okay? But even if we do find ourselves in this world where primary elections determine who gets elected, it can still have an important role because if, part, if primary voters are relatively more extreme than general election voters, and they care about the electability of their candidates, so they, they're constrained by the general election, then higher periods of, gen, of legislative gridlock is going to allow them to nominate someone relatively more extreme because they know the general electorate is more likely to vote for them. Okay, so it can still have bite in this story. The second thing I want to mention is about this supply side constraint. So our theory very much relies on the fact that an extreme co runs against an opponent because in our theory, the, the voter, the moderate voter would actually rather vote for a moderate co over an extreme co -parson. Okay, so to get polarization, we need this supply side constraint. Now this is empirically true. Okay, there's a robust evidence from Andy Hall and Daniel Thompson to show that moderate candidates or moderate citizens simply choose not to run. And so we are constrained by a supply side constraint such as that that we look at. But then of course, you know, to get explaining uh, polarization, the question then becomes, well, why do we have this short supply? Okay. And there's different theories you could put forward for that. Our theory also provides a demand side theory about why we should have this short supply. So we've seen increasing levels of legislative gridlock for the last half century or so. That's going to lead moderate voters to be more likely to support extreme candidates. And so the electoral advantage that moderate candidates previously enjoyed is getting smaller over time, okay? And beyond just being a theory, this is actually empirically true. So there's recent work by Utich in Journal of Politics that shows that since the 1980s, moderate candidates have enjoyed an electoral advantage, but that's been shrinking over time. And so that can explain this, uh, this supply side constraint emerging. Okay. So that's the bits about literature. Let me uh, move on to experimental design and then some of our core results. Okay, so the basic structure of the experiment is that we first ask subjects for their partisan leaning. So generally speaking, do you view yourself as a Democrat or a Republican? We then block them into different versions of the survey. So if you're self-identified Republican, you see one version. If you're self-identified Democrat, you see another version. And I'll talk about it later, but we essentially exclude non-partisans, okay? We then elicit policy preferences, okay? We do this for a range of different policy issues. And again, for the different uh, branches of the survey, I'm going to tell you about the democratic version of the survey and, and focus on the treated policy issue, which is the federal minimum wage, okay? So this is an example. We say uh, the federal minimum wage is currently 7.25 per hour. Here are three policies. We want you to rank them from most to least preferred, okay? And so it's a 10, you could have a status quo policy of 7.25, you could increase it to 10, or you could increase it to 35. Okay, and a moderate subject is someone who prefers partisan changes in their preferred direction, so long as they're not too big. Okay, so their preference ordering is 10, then 725, then 35. Okay, and this is just like in the uh, theoretical framework. We then have the treatment and placebo conditions. So we randomly assign half the subjects information about gridlock. Again, this is for the democratic subjects. The first paragraph emphasizes their own party's historic failings to increase the minimum wage to $15 per hour. So this is why it's a treated policy issue, we emphasize it. And then there's a more general statement saying, in general, most policies that are proposed fail to become law around 1% uh, most recently passed. And here's a graph, okay? We do the same thing for Republicans. The second half is identical, but the first half emphasizes a different policy issue. It's emphasizing large cuts to the Environmental Protection Agency. Okay, and that's the treated policy issue for Republicans. And then the placebo group sees information about the Winter Olympics, which of course is irrelevant to, to gridlock. Okay. Then after being exposed to the treatment potentially or the placebo, we elicit subjects' beliefs about the possibility of policy change. Okay, and again, this is just one example. We say, suppose your district representative is a Democrat who proposes a, an increase of $10 per hour to the minimum wage. How likely is it that this will pass? 
Okay, they can answer certainly to impossible on a six point scale. We do the same for the $35 minimum wage and again for many other policy areas. Okay. And then our main outcomes are coming from these hypothetical elections where you have a Republican running against a Democrat. There's two different policy positions or policy areas and they hold different policy positions there. We then ask subjects who they would vote for in an election. So a binary outcome, candidate one or candidate two. And we also ask them how likely they are to vote for candidate one or candidate two. So this is a smoother version of the same question. It gets us a measure of intensity of preferences perhaps, okay? And just to remind you that the main setting of interest is when we have a partisan subject who's moderate on the treated policy issue, and they see an extreme co-partisan running on that same issue and an out-partisan who maintains a status quo policy. And we want to think about the effect of our gridlock treatment on their willingness to support this extreme co-partisan. So the main specification we run will be a very simple and, and conservative uh, regression. So we're going to have two different regressions, one for Democrats and one for Republicans. And this is because they see completely different versions of the survey, so there's no reason to combine them. We have an outcome variable, a constant, and then a dummy variable for the treatment. So this is just one if they saw the gridlock treatment and zero otherwise. And we have kind of two sets of outcome variables of interest. The first is enactment beliefs. So after being exposed to the treatment or placebo, how likely do you believe policy change is possible? Okay. The second is the support for these co-partisans in these hypothetical elections. And again, we have two versions. We have this binary measure and this smoother measure of support. Okay. And our subsample of interest for our main prediction is partisan subjects who have moderate preferences on the treated policy issue. Okay. So let me briefly do some descriptive statistics before we uh, present the results. So the survey was fielded in October 2022 and May 2023. We have a combined sample of about 8,700 uh, voting age Americans, so citizens over the age of 18, to representative on age, gender, and state of residence. And we use the company uh, responding in Berlin to distribute the survey. So to break down the numbers a little bit, we have about 3,600 self-identifying Democrats, 3,100 self-identifying Republicans, the second wave excluded nonpartisans because our theory doesn't use nonpartisans. Okay, and we should have done that in the first wave, but we didn't. Um, in terms of subjects that have moderate preferences on the treated issue, we have a thousand Democrats and four hundred and sixty Republicans. And then these main outcomes that we're looking at are these hypothetical elections, and so sometimes we get a little bit more. And so we have about thirteen hundred Democratic data points and five hundred and twelve Republican data points. Okay. These are the distribution of preferences on the treated issue. So the left-hand side is for Democrats. It's for the federal minimum wage. The status quo is the voters who prefer the status quo policy the most, then the, uh, then the moderate change, then the extreme change. The moderate are those that we've been talking about. They want partisan changes in their preferred direction, so long as they're not too large. And the extremes are those who want extreme policies as much as they can get. Okay, and then you have other. And the second set is for... EPA preferences, this is for Republican subjects for cuts to the Environmental Protection Agency. Now, one thing you might notice is that we have a, a pretty large share of moderate Democratic subjects on the wage policy. For Republicans on the Environmental Protection Agency, it's not so large, uh, it's a bit small. And so you might wonder whether, you know, one of my core premises is that most voters are moderate actually holds here. Okay, and, and thinking about the data, we, we do think that this is true even in our sample as well, because if you think that actually, rather than having subjects that want moderate changes in their preferred direction and dislike extreme changes, you should also think about voters who actually just dislike any change, right? They, they like the status quo. So you could think about moderate and status quo voters as being, you know, really the, the, the true moderates in, in this broader framework. And if you do that, then actually this combined group is the largest group in terms of policy preferences. Or you might want to take a simple approach and just ask, how many subjects actually prefer the status quo or the moderate policy over the extreme policy? Okay, and there you see there's large supermajorities of both Democrats and Republicans who fit that category. Okay, and so we do think within our sample, we are capturing this core premise that voters are actually moderate. So uh, let me jump into some results. So the first thing I we have show... a question, if I may, Barty. Sure. Yeah, yeah, please. I find it interesting that 
without combining the groups. Your other group has so many observations. Of course, other allows many permutations of preferences. So mm -hmm. that explains part of it. But still, can you say something about this other group? Is there, because it is, to me at least, um, uh, actually quite surprising that other would comprise such a large group. So, so do you have anything interesting to say about this other group? So I'll say two things. I don't know if they're interesting. <laughs> So the first is that uh, it includes non-single peaks preferences, okay? And so as you know, theorists, it's hard to think about what that means because all our policies are very much ordered in, in a natural way. Um, but it does also include one other one other preference profile, which is which is single peaked, which is people who are moderately extreme. So I want uh, the moderate policy is my most preferred position. My second most preferred is an extreme position, and my least preferred is a status quo. Okay. And we do analyze them in, in, in the paper. Uh, in these graphs, we should probably separate them so we can see what share they are. I don't know what share they are from the top of my head. Uh, but I suspect there's a lot of non-single peaks preferences sitting in that other group. Okay. Okay, so I'll jump into the, the first uh, result, which is a basic thing just to verify that our treatment works as intended. Okay, so what I'm plotting here is uh, on the top, the treatment effect for Democrats. What we're asking is the question uh, in, for the moderate policy, for example, is suppose a Democrat is elected to your district who promises a $10 minimum wage, how likely is this to go through? Okay. After being exposed to the treatment, there's a negative shift in their response to this question on a six point scale. And we've got confidence intervals, 90 and 95% plotted there. So you can see it's statistically significant. We see the same for the extreme policy, which is a $35 minimum wage. Okay. And we see the same for the Republicans for cuts to the Environmental Protection Agency. Okay, so you shouldn't think about the magnitude too much here because they're a bit hard to interpret. But the main thing is that there's a systematic shift in their belief about the possibility of policy change. They become more pessimistic. In some sense, their perception of gridlock is is heightened, and they and they believe gridlock is high. So just I know you've just said we shouldn't think about this, but but it, <laughs> it I mean the the first graph is you know, it's, it's worth noticing, right? Because it's not, you're more pessimistic about moderate views than extreme views. So that... So so, of what's missing here is the baseline level. Yeah. Okay? So you could imagine that, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you could imagine people believe enacting an extreme $35 minimum wage is almost certainly going to fail. And so when I tell you that most policies fail and they get exposed to this gridlock treatment, there's not a lot of room for this to decrease, right? Okay. So, so that could explain this and I should verify that, but, but that's my... Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So the main result that we have is that gridlock can cause elite polarization, can lead moderate voters to support extreme co-partisans at higher rates, okay? And so what I'm plotting here, I just want to show you uh, this first figure on the left-hand side and this first column for Democrats, okay? On the y-axis, we have propensity to vote, so how often they vote for their co-partisan, okay? And we're looking at these hypothetical elections where I said I'm a Democrat, and I told you I was, had moderate policy preferences on the federal minimum wage, and I see an extreme co-partisan running who advocates for a $35 minimum wage and a Republican out-partisan who's maintaining the status quo, Okay. The gray box shows you the placebo group. So this absent any information about gridlock, they still vote for the extreme co-partisan around 65% of the time, despite not liking their position on this federal minimum wage issue. When you expose them to the gridlock treatment, we get this white box. So it increases by about 12 percentage points. And we've got uh, confidence intervals there, so it's statistically significant. And so they become much more likely to support these extreme co-partisans, okay? We have this second set of graphs. So this y-axis is likelihood to vote. This is a smoother version of support. How likely you vote for candidate one or candidate two. And we see qualitatively the same pattern there. Okay, the placebo group is down here. When they're exposed to information about gridlock, they become more likely to say that they would support their co-partisan, okay, who holds these extreme positions. For Republicans, which are in the second column of each graph, we see similar qualitative effects they're definitely noisier, and that's because we have about half the sample size. We have 500 uh, data points here, okay? But we do we do get marginal significance in this second measure of support, and so we do think overall this is, uh, you know, strong evidence that, that indeed gridlock can cause moderate voters to support extreme co-partisans at higher rates, okay? Now, this is the main prediction. 
of course, there's many alternative theories that could explain this one uh, this this one pattern. And so let me tell you about some of the alternative theories we explore in the paper and perhaps some of the broader uh, predictions that we make as well. Okay. So one theory that might first come to mind is this idea that gridlock simply increases partisanship. You tell me there's high levels of gridlock. I'm a Democrat. I interpret that in a partisan lens. I blame the Republicans. And so now I want to vote for my side more now than ever. Okay. That would be consistent with, with the last uh, graphs I showed you. Right? So what we can do to try to push against this theory is to think about a hypothetical election in our, in our experiment where there's no extreme candidate running. Okay, So my co-partisan is actually moderate, and I see an out-partisan running. Okay? In our theory, uh, I should just vote for my moderate co-partisan at maximal rate, and gridlock should have no effect on that. Whereas this theory says that actually I should be more likely to vote for them after being exposed to the gridlock treatment because I become more partisan. Okay. And so what I'm plotting here is uh, these hypothetical elections where I have a moderate co-partisan running against an out-partisan rather than an extreme co-partisan. Okay, and again, it's the same structure of the last slides. So what you see in this first column for Democrats and the propensity to vote, we have this gray box for the placebo group. They vote for their moderate co-partisan around 80, 89% of the time. Okay, so it's very high, that's nice. It's consistent with their, you know, their stated preferences seem to match their revealed preferences, so that's nice. After being exposed to gridlock, it increases by one or two percentage points, but it's not statistically significant. Okay? We see the same for the Democrats in this second measure of support. Okay? There is an increase, but, it, but it's not statistically significant. For Republicans, we see uh, similar effects as well. So there's much le lower level of baseline support, okay? but we do see that there's no statistically significant treatment effect. Okay? So it doesn't seem that subjects are simply becoming more partisan. Another theory that might come to mind is more psychological or perhaps behavioral is that you tell me there's high levels of gridlock. I was a moderate who wanted a $10 minimum wage, but now I want a $35 minimum wage. So your, your gridlock treatment actually made me more extreme. Okay. So what we actually did in the experiment is after exposing people to the treatment, we also asked them about their policy preferences a second time. So we have a measure of post, pre and post uh, treatment policy preferences. And so we can directly test uh, whether our treatment made people more extreme. Okay. And so again, we do the same econometric regression. We just have an outcome constant, the treatment variable. And our outcome is going to be looking only at subjects who are moderate pre-treatment. And then it's going to equal one if they went from being moderate to being extreme. Okay. And I'm not going to show you the table because it's not so nice to look at, but there's no evidence that the treatment directly affects preferences by making moderate subjects extreme. Okay. Now, the third theory that, that might come to mind is, is somewhat related is that, well, maybe gridlock doesn't make me more extreme, but it makes me think about the legislative process. I realize that it's hard to pass legislation. And so if I want a $10 minimum wage, what I need to do is not elect someone who's going to fight for a $10 minimum wage, but elect someone who wants a $35 minimum wage. If I put someone extreme in, that's going to shift this bargaining process and get me closer to what I want. Okay. So this is a much trickier theory to, to test, but we think we can, we can push back against it because the ideal setting that you would like to have is an, an election where you have an extreme co-partisan running against a moderate uh, co-partisan, okay? So a primary election, right? And this theory would say that, well, after being exposed to the gridlock treatment, I should vote for my extreme co-partisan over my moderate co-partisan, okay? In other words, my utility should be higher from electing extreme co-partisan than a moderate pro -pass. So we don't have that election, but we do have two sets of elections that we think are useful for getting at this question. So the first is when you have an extreme co running against an opposition. The second set is when you have a moderate co running against an opposition. Because we randomize, on average, the opponent is of the same quality, okay? And so this alternative theory will tell us, well, if the subject's utility is higher from electing an extreme co then their support from the extreme co in the first set of elections should be at least as high as their support for a moderate co in the second set of elections, okay, if this story is true on average. Whereas our theory says the reverse. It says, actually, you should support the extreme co at a strictly lower rate or, or lower rate than the moderate co in, in the second set of elections, okay, because I get lower utility from electing an extreme co in our frame than a moderate co okay. So 
what I'm plotting here is essentially those last two sets of bar graphs that we saw on the same axes, okay? Well, we're looking at propensity to vote in this first figure and, and Democrats, okay? We have extreme copartisans in this first bar graph and the second bar graph is my support for the moderate copartisan in the second set of elections, okay? And what you see in the placebo group is that they vote for their moderate copartisan around 90% of the time, and they support their extreme copartisan around 65% of the time, and so they're voting for the moderate copartisan at higher rates, okay? When we expose them to this information about gridlock, they still keep this relative order. They still vote for the extreme copartisan at higher rates than they support the, sorry, they still vote for the moderate copartisan at higher rates than they support the extreme copartisan, okay? What gridlock does is it increases my propensity to vote for the extreme copartisan, but it never changes the order. So I just become the, the electoral penalty that an extreme copartisan faces is now smaller, okay? But it never switches its relative practice. And this is true in this second measure of, of support, this likelihood to vote, this uh, kind of third figure from left to right. And it's also true for Republicans, okay? So it's a bit noisier. We have, we have noisier estimates, but, but we still see this relative order holds true. Okay, so those are the core alternative theories that, that came to our mind first, at least, and that's what we explore in the, in the paper. Of course, there's a lot more in the paper. So as I mentioned when I was presenting the, the theory that the framework is not specific to moderate subjects. So you could think about, well, what if the voter is extreme that you want extreme policies? Then our model says that, well, gridlock should not change an extreme voter's propensity to support an extreme or moderate co-partisan in, the, in these races. And that's consistent with the data. We also can think about voters who actually want to maintain the status quo and dislike policy change. And we can show that gridlock should, just like our moderate voters, increase their propensity to vote for an extreme co-partisan, okay? But in addition, it should increase their propensity to vote for a moderate co-partisan, okay? In the data, we find a null effect, which is consistent with certain distributions of, of, of salience parameters in our model. So it's not against our theory, but, but, it's, uh, but it's not exactly uh, perfectly in line with the kind of strict prediction of the theory. So the final thing I'll say about results before I start to conclude is that uh, I mentioned that in the survey, we asked about many different policy issues, okay? And I, and I really just focused on the treated policy issue in, in the experiment for the, the results that I showed you. But of course, it's possible that when we tell people in the treatment that the minimum wage has failed to move despite attempts by the Democrats, that they interpret that there's going to be gridlock on many other issues. So they have some model in mind that, that correlates gridlock across policy issues. Okay. And so what we can ask is whether our treatment had these spillover effects. Okay. And so I don't have a lot of time to talk through all the different policy areas, but I'll just kind of summarize briefly what we're doing here. So we're looking at these enactment beliefs. So after being exposed to the treatment, which focused on minimum wage for Democrats and environmental protection agency cuts for Republicans, we can ask whether it affected their belief about the possibility of policy change on a range of different policy issues. So for Democrats, this is the first figure. We look at the abortion policy area. We have an extreme and moderate policy, gun control, vehicle regulation, and corporate income taxes, sorry. And we have the same for Republicans. Okay, and what you see is after being exposed to this treatment, which focuses on the minimum wage, there's a systematic shift in uh, subjects' beliefs about the possibility of policy change. They become more pessimistic. Okay, for Democrats, it's negative in all cases and it's statistically significant in all cases but one. For Republicans, broadly the same pattern holds too. Okay, we have negative estimates on every policy issue. There's one that's not statistically significant, one that is maybe marginally statistically significant. Uh, just marginally not statistically significant. Okay, so we do see that there are spillovers in their beliefs. You can ask whether our main prediction that gridlock causes polarization by leading moderate voters to support extreme copartisans also holds. Okay, and so here we're looking at the probability of voting for my extreme copartisan on each of these issues when they're, my copartisan is extreme on this issue and I'm moderate on this issue. Okay, so we're matching issues. And the all category combines all, all topics together. For Democrats, you see that in the all category, we do have this uh, effect that we predict that's mainly driven by the treated policy of minimum wage. We see, you know, maybe an effect on, on vehicle regulation, but not a lot else. Okay. We think that this is arising because of ceiling effects, right? So you can see the placebo group in all these cases is supporting their extreme copartisan at rates above 70%. Okay. 
even above 80% in the case of vehicles. Whereas in the federal minimum wage, which was a treated issue, it was actually 65%. Okay, so it was much lower than all of these. Okay. And you can see this in the Republican case where the baseline support is indeed lower. And you do see uh, much more evidence of this core prediction coming out across these areas. Okay, so it's not always statistically significant, but there are there are a few cases. Okay. You can also look at this second measure, this likelihood to vote, this smoother version. And again, you see similar patterns. But so for Democrats, it's not, you know, there's some movement, but it's not, it's not uh, perfect. For Republicans, you see a much more systematic effect. Again, we're lacking sample size, but we, we do see effects. Okay. So let me start to wrap up with, with some broader implications and you know, why we care about this or what we should take away from this paper. So one view of what we've presented is that it, it sheds a less pessimistic light over polarization and the health of democratic institutions in the sense that many institutions were designed to limit policy change and actually create gridlock, right? So separations of powers, checks and balances, anti-majoritarian rules in our institutions. And so when voters trust that these institutions will work well and as intended, then our framework says polarization will arise because voters are willing to support extreme candidates because they know that it's not going to have severe policy consequences. The institutions are going to work well, they're going to constrain policy. Okay. And so rather than polarization being a sign of institutions under frustration or, or under stress, it's actually a sign of institutions working well and people believing that they're going to work well. Okay. Now, that's, of course, a very uh, optimistic view of the process, so we don't take it for granted. It could, of course, be the case that voters systematically overestimate gridlock, and if that's the case, they're going to elect extreme candidates at higher rates than they themselves would like, and polarization is indeed a concern. But even if they have accurate beliefs, voters might fail to internalize the broader societal cost of polarization. So maybe there's an erosion of social trust. And maybe it leads to effective polarization or decline of the quality of, of political candidates, right? And if we're concerned about these broader concerns, it, it highlights a, an important trade-off for constitution design between policy stability and polarization, right? Institutions that provide greater policy stability are inevitably going to lead to gridlock and then via mechanism polarization. And one response to reduce polarization is to allow institutions to be more responsive, okay? Of course, that comes with its own risks, and so you need to evaluate this carefully, but this is uh, a trade-off that our framework highlights. Okay. So I'll, I'll conclude now. So uh, we proposed a mechanism by which gridlock can cause elite polarization. The basic idea is simple. It's that voters discount extremism. They believe that policy change is unlikely when there's high levels of legislative gridlock, and because of this, they're willing to support extreme co-partisans who hold positions that even they themselves don't like. We provide experimental evidence in support of our main prediction and mechanism, and we show that our evidence that we have is, is hard to reconcile with many alternative theories or mechanisms that might try to explain our, our core prediction. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to uh, take questions if there's any. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, well, a uh, few people have uh, raised their hands. So Cezy, Clement, and Adam, I think Adam was first, but you know, um, I'll, <laughs> I can't guarantee that. Adam, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question on just in terms of understanding on your ruling out that people actually change their preference uh, to more extremism when they are treated with the gridlock treatment. And do I understand correctly that those people you, you ask twice always, so before and after. So in a sense, I feel like it's it's true that you you make it difficult for them to actually reveal that they changed their preference because they would have to revise their opinion. And if you don't, um, or like contradict themselves, um, which I think people don't like to do on surveys, people don't like to do in general, to contradict themselves within a span of five minutes or so. Um, so I was wondering if um, a better test would have been to ask one group only after the treatment about their preference and compare that to the baseline of similar people who have been asked before the treatment, if you see what I mean. So if among the group that you asked before the treatment, you, you see a lower proportion of extremism than those who ask only after the treatment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then this would be indicative that people might actually change their 
preference. Whereas if they don't, if these groups are similar, then this I would see as very strong evidence that people do not change their views. But I think asking them twice before and after treatment is not is is because of this problem of people not wanting to change their answer. I think is is I, I don't think it can rule out that that mechanism. Yeah, so so perhaps there's better ways to do it. I will. I, I don't want to get into the debate, but it is true that there is a debate about how strong this consistency bias is and whether we can ask questions pre and post and mm -hmm. whether we should expect it to be completely useless if we do that or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously we're taking the route that it is useful. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think there's some experimental work trying to uh, check whether it matters or not or just how big a problem it is. Um, but yeah, you're right. We could have explored other options and maybe that would have been nicer. But I think at the same time, it's, it's you know, we, we ruled out this, we tried to rule out this alternative theory because it's one that might come up, but it's not very well theoretically founded, right? Like, I think the idea that maybe I want to get a more extreme person after being exposed to gridlock, but I keep my preferences seems much more natural than the one that I suddenly just become extreme, right? But uh, I agree with your, with your point. Okay, so uh, next is Sezi, who I've just been told actually was first to raise her hand. So not only did I not go with ladies first, but I actually, I, I went ladies last, it seems. Anyway, I'll remedy now. Go on. I, uh, I was going to suggest alphabetical, but both Adam and Kumat have uh, first names that start uh, before <laughs> mine. So I went with gender instead. Um, uh, yeah, so Barton, thank you so much for a really interesting paper. Um one thing I was thinking is I worried that maybe you were stacking the deck against yourself a little bit with your Republican treatment in the sense that, um, you know, my sense is in terms of if you think about cognitive demands, right, in terms of the of the policy that you were working with, um, whereas the minimum wage is very simple, it's very prominent mm -hmm. in the media, people know a lot about it, but um, the EPA requires a little bit more thinking, right, like what is, you know, what does this really mean? Yeah. Um, and so maybe some people were thinking indirectly that uh, it's going to lower taxes, you know what I mean? Or that yeah. there's other types of mm -hmm. things going on or making government smaller and 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 the yeah. variety of things. So I was wondering if there's anything, you know, like if you have other things in the survey to sort of clean that up a little to just mm -hmm. to um, it might get rid of some of that noise where it was something about how they were interpreting it. Right. Um, yeah. The other way that might help with cleaning up some of that noise is if um um, I know you taught you blocked on a bunch of stuff in your sample, but um, by states would like depending on the different primary rules, just mm -hmm. because sometimes if you think about the practice of voting and strategic, especially the places where there's strategic primaries, where mm -hmm. it's part of the discourse for them to sort of vote in this way, it might be, you know, sort of clean up some of that. And so you, you might be able to see a little bit easier with that um, uh, or cut back on some of that noise that you're getting with the Republican Republican views. Um, the last is if you have anything in your survey, um, like I was actually thinking for the other policy issues would be a nice um, a falsification test, right? Rather than, uh, I wasn't thinking of them as spillover. I was thinking of mm -hmm. them as more, mm -hmm. you know, are there some in there that you can use for the opposite party as sort of a nice, just to show that um, it's not just some sort of weird experimental demand, experimenter demand type of effect. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, super great um, project and really interesting to see sort of the opposite as, uh, as what we always see. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so I think what we found out is that we're much better at writing policies for Democrats than Republicans. <laughs> as you can see, the kind of share of moderates and, and these treatment effects. Um, yeah, and then when we, look, when we look at these spillover effects, we do see much stronger effects for Republicans on some of these other issues. And so in terms of whether there were other policy issues that were more salient, I think that speaks to that. Um, but you're right, you know, our, our spillover effects could have been interpreted in a different way. But the one thing I want to emphasize is that gridlock treatment emphasizes a specific policy area, but it also said in general, most policies I propose fail to become law, around 1% of policies. And then there's a graph of that. And so it's, I think it's natural to expect spillover effects in, given our treatment, right? Thank you. Okay, Clement. Hey, yeah, um, yeah. It's really cool to see the the whole paper like that. And uh, <laughs> one thing I was wondering is, so if I got this right, the only thing they get about the candidate is their position on that particular policy, 
and the party, right? Um, but so in general, you would tend to think that a given politician's preferences across policies are quite correlated, right? So if I'm ex an extreme on, on minimum wage, I'm going to be extreme on all the other policies as well. So I don't know if you have anything from the data to say about that, but why do you think then these moderates still like these co-partisans, right? What does it mean to be co-partisan? When someone's extreme, you know, why why do I like a Democrat just for being a Democrat if I think they're an extreme Democrat? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like this this party affiliation we think about as capturing policy. So even though they're extreme on some issues and disagree with the party a lot, they're still going to vote for them on some things, right? And so certainly on procedural matters, you see a lot of uh, by uh, co-partisanship, right? Uh, and that, that does lead to policy gains, right? Mm. You're right if they're extreme on everything and there's zero uh, agreement between them and the party, then you're going to run into these issues. But as long as there's some cooperation at least, then, then you should still have these effects, right? Mm. And they'd certainly be smaller, right? Um, and so maybe in the more recent era, we're concerned that maybe that's uh, less likely to be true, maybe with the Republican mm. Party. Um, but, but you know, I think we are capturing something that, that has been true for a long time, right? Right. And in a sense, your, your results show that people don't expect these correlations, right? Or or don't think that they're applied to all policies because otherwise they would have yeah. stuck with the other guys. So. So, so they do have two policy positions in these kind of choice tasks. And so we could explore the case where they're extreme on two dimensions mm. and I'm moderate on those same two dimensions as opposed to one. Right. Um, we have done that in the past. We end up with a very small sample. But um, I think we, we could do more to kind of speak to this question and whether the effects are smaller or bigger in that case. Mm -hmm. And then that might speak to, to your question about whether they you know, do this calculus in the way you're suggesting or in some other way. Nice, thanks. Okay, um, anybody else who wants to ask a question? Um, okay, maybe I can ask a question. I, I'm wondering, well, I, I have to admit, I'm not entirely sure I understand the argument for, um, for you know, sort of a, the time series version of the argument, which is why has this increased over time, right? And mm -hmm. um, you basically have this theory that says once gridlock starts, then we, we, we can explain why it might continue. But again, it does have this element that it seems to me, but correct me if I'm wrong, that it, it needs the argument that people who are extremists tend to participate in elections more and, you know, or at least are the candidates that we find. And, you know, um, I'm not sure. I So my first guess as a, as a theory, why are candidates more extreme than before is precisely that now turnout is more important than it was before, right? That that would be, I'm not sort of the first one to mention this, that rather than, you know, being a moderate who tries to swing the medium voter, what you're doing is you're just uh, more concerned about getting the people that support your side to show up. And in order to do that, you have to, you have to, extreme candidates are relatively better at that. So I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. And and the other thing is um, because you have this institutional dimension, right? So how big, bad is gridlock and so on? I'm wondering whether you could, I mean, I was thinking, for example, in the UK, we definitely have some polarization as well, but it's certainly not a system with as many checks and balances as the United States. Now, it's probably too hard to compare the two across, but maybe in the within the US, you have states or, you know, I don't know whether people care about state politics or not, but uh, you have states where there's more gridlock and less gridlock and things like that. I wonder whether you could look at that then rather than just the Republican, uh, Democrat dimension, you know, across the nation, I suppose. So that yeah. that those are just two two ideas. Sure. So you're right. So to get this process started, to start this kind of time series of polarization and gridlock, something needs to begin, one of the two in our theory. Um, that's, you know, a huge puzzle in political science about why do we have polarization, right? And there's many, many suggestions and many, many reasons why each of those suggestions is not the core cause. And so I don't have an answer for that. Um, but, but, you know, 
it's a, it's an important question and our theory is not going to not going to get at that um in terms of states with gridlock it's a little bit hard in the us so gridlock is quite low in 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 many states legislatures despite high levels of polarization and it's typically because you have very large supermajorities in these states or, or you know less checks and balances and so on um so you know i guess we wouldn't expect to see this mechanism playing out there so much um but, but we could explore that more anybody else okay uh 